Just like that, I'm back. <laughs> Fucking back. Holy shit. Probably lost 10 years off my life, but whatever. It was fun. Hmm. <laughs> Where to start? Still in a bit of a bit of a fog. Bit of a fog. About a day and a half travel to get home. Well, two days. Whatever. Call it two days. Travel to get home, driving in sleet, snow, ice, and fog. But a pain in the butt. But made it safe. Where to start? I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to say. It's funny. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that's the first time that I've actually went and went. I went cold turkey on everything. You know, I haven't skipped sharing voices on here for what how many years for maybe the odd time it make me the lot longest time it would have been two or three days because of glitches or something but i haven't actually went in hyper focused focused on something that i love to do in a long time like absolute block everything out don't do anything but i didn't even i didn't even put a video camera in my pocket which i normally do i'm always trying to uh, make sure i got a video camera ready to video stuff so i can share it it's a real different kind of experience. I'm not sure if I can put it into words. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I can put people there with me to understand that don't get it. I don't know. Um, I left some trail cameras out when I, on my last elk hunt in some, in some places where I knew there would possibly be a big old buck or more. And, uh, sure enough, from the very beginning, I, I got there, I got to the woods. And uh, I checked a couple of these cameras out, and sure enough, there's this great, big, huge old buck. And I went to, I mean, that was a while back. It was a couple weeks before I got there. But then I started checking other cameras, and sure enough, he's still around there. And then I went into absolute tunnel vision, absolutely engorged and wrapped up in what I love to do. And uh, I blocked everything out. It was like I was, it's like I left the planet for a little while. I can't describe it. It's like I leave and go somewhere else. And uh, Adventure Dog, super stoked I'm back. She's getting freaking huge. I just gave her a big juicy bone with a lot of meat on it. But anyway, I, um, so what I did was physically, just so you know, I would get up on a five o'clock in the morning be in the woods before sun up. I would spend my morning um, specifically trying to hunt this buck in a, in, a, in a little bit of an area. No show, no nothing. Then I would start doing my rounds and I'd start doing big hikes for the rest half of the day, trying to figure out where he's going and coming from because it seemed like he was showing up every second day on a couple on a video on a trail camera or whatever, right? So, okay, I'm getting ahead of him. I'm probably not making any sense. The buck was entering this area where I got my huge buck last year, but he wasn't staying there. There was no does there. So he would take off and come back and take off, come back. Sometimes at 10 in the morning, sometimes at two in the morning, sometimes at eight in the morning, all around the clock. So you could not accurately guess where he's going to show up. And I was trying to figure out where he's coming, going from on average. And I was just starting to narrow it down. And why I'm sharing, I'm building up to why I'm sharing this with you. I know there's not a lot of enthusiastic hunters here, but there's going to be a part of the story that all of you, sh I would imagine, would find interesting. So in the mornings, my routine would be to slowly sneak up this old deactivated road, all grown in this old road from where it was logged off years ago, very methodically, stealthfully, slowly, because that road he's commonly using. And I would sneak my way up there. Then I get to the top and I'd look over at the back side of this little hole. I'd go to the front side and I'd sit down on the end of this log overlooking this little this little shelf below me where I could reach out to maximum maybe 200 yards across from me. And this arena was 200 yards across and maybe 250 wide. Christmas trees and regrowth and old poplars, new poplar growth. So what I'm trying to say is, take note, I would slowly and stealthily hunt my way up there at first light, okay? You'd be crazy 
to just go marching up this old road because I've got this guy on this road at all hours of the day hitting a couple trail cameras I'd left on it. Try to figure out where he's coming and going to. Anyway, um, this is a significant part for this channel. I'll put a full hunt videos on the How to Hunt channel later on about this trip, all right? So anyway, get this one. I think I was on day nine. I don't know if it was nine or 11 days on him straight. And what I would do is I get up in the morning, be in the woods before dark, do my hunt. And then I would do a huge hike, say on top of that side of the mountain. I do a huge hike over here for the last half. I do a huge hike over here for the last half, a huge hike over here for the last half, trying to find sign of where he might be going so that I can concentrate on where he's going to and from and hopefully harvest him, right? So uh, I think she needs to go out. I just fed her like two pounds of frickin' meat. I'll just get this point done quick. And um, finally on about, I don't know, the last day, obviously, I got up in the morning and I felt an urgency. Now take note, I always explain to everybody on this channel, having for what, some, quite some time is to get in tune with your with yourself, with your instincts, with your gut feelings, with your sixth sense, whatever we call it, whatever is the right description for it. I've always been trying to urge people to try and get in tune with their gut feelings or instincts to make their decisions that way. Because I've shared numerous times, I have learned how to use my, I don't know, what should we call it? I don't know. Let's use our gut. Let's call it the gut. I've been using my gut to make all of my decisions in life across the board for quite some time now and I am winning. All right, I'm making right decisions across the board for some time now, which is the uber opposite of what I've done for many years previous. <laughs> anyway, I felt this urgency to hurry up at right of first light and march my ass up the mountain, which is really weird because you'd be a dumbass to do that as a hunter because this massive buck has been using this old road non-stop around the clock different hours so i'd be a dummy to just go running up that road i'm going to spook him i'm not going to see anything and everything's going to see me but i went with my gut my gut was screaming at me to hustle your ass up there don't look over here don't look over here don't look in there don't look in there which i normally do just go I'm like holy cow all right i'm going and else also I never hike fast in the morning because then I get sweaty and I get wet and I can't sit and wait anywhere for a while because I'll freeze to death. So I always try to go at a certain pace to keep my sweat down to as minimal as possible. So I went, what I'm seeing is I went against everything. All my common sense, my past knowledge, um, my discipline, I went against it all because my gut was screaming at me too. This is so, it's, it's such a bizarre experience, but I have to share this. So I go marching, double take, boom, 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 boom. I'm marching straight up that mountain on the road. And the farther I got along, the more I got light out, the more of a, almost a, not a panicked, not panicking, but an urgency, urgent, hurry up, go, hurry, 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 hurry. I'm like, what the hell's going on, right? And I was sweating and huffing and puffing. I mean, I was sweat just coming up my face. I'm going up the old road, I get to the top where I got to sneak straight up on a, on, a, on the flat top and then I sneak out to the right and I peek down to this that open area but there's a little pocket in the backside which is exactly where I harvested that big buck last year and I have to go look at that pocket first so I actually go away from that area to look over the pocket but I don't know what where my guts lead me am I supposed to be looking over the pocket I don't know no no I knew it wasn't because I knew I had to hurry up it was almost like talking to myself okay well hurry up and go look over there then it's almost like my gut knew it was a waste of time. It's just, I'm trying to explain it. It was very odd, but very clear. It was very clear. The message my gut was giving me was absolutely clear. And now I'm basically run walking to go look over there. Look, 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 look. No, he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. Get over there. And then I go ripping it. I go ripping through the the new poplars and the willows and get over the top and I'm slowly and I'm coming to where I might be seen. I'm coming over the, the height of land, skyline in a way, but I'm using Christmas trees behind me to break it up and I look over and slowly moving and there's a female doe mule deer out in the middle of the clearing, which I've been begging to see a doe because there's been no does anywhere, which is why the buck's been coming and going and coming and going and not staying and not allowing me to 
not being there for me to hunt them. And I don't know why I kept coming back because there was no does and no snow. A little bit of snow. I'm getting ahead of myself. If I had fresh snow and a doe, he would have been dead days ago. But there isn't. So I can't even track him down once he hits the camera. So I slowly come over the knob. There's the doe. I'm going absolutely slow. I'm not, I'm not moving my head. I'm like looking everywhere with my eyeballs, trying to keep my movement down to low roar. I'm looking everywhere. He's got to be here. He's got to be here. He's got to be here. And this is after about nine or 10 or 11 days of not never seeing him, but no one is there. I look down to my right about 20 yards and here's a female, uh, her twins. Her twins are right there 20 yards away looking up at me. I'm like, oh no, because I really want to just settle in, sit beyond my log and watch the doe as long as I could. But I can't because I'm busted. Look down. Uh oh. And I'm trying to go like this. I scratch myself looking, you know, like innocent. Scratch myself. I'm carrying my body language to go like this, you know, and I'll glance down and they're like, uh uh, we know you're bad. And they go bouncing away. So mule deer, they bounce when they're alarmed, right? And they're not on a panic bounce, but enough to make that alarming sound. And now they're bouncing. I'm like, uh-oh, here's the alarm sound. I'm looking around. The doe's still standing there. I'm not, I'm trying not to make any movement, but I'm, I'm frantic looking at my eyeballs. And there he was. He was about another 40 yards past them behind a screen of new poplar trees. And there he goes, bouncing down, ripping down the road fast. I'm like, oh my God, no, that's him. You gotta be kidding me. And then, uh, anyways, I ended, up, I ended up harvesting him. And no, I didn't shoot him on the run, although it was tempting. I waited until he slowed. I got very lucky, slowed and went into an opening. A little bit screened, but I ended up shooting him in the heart twice. So there you go. Harvesting. But what I'm getting at is, I know it's a bit of a long story, is I it was so bizarre for me to be absolutely aware of my gut feeling, my gut instinct. And, and I followed it. And my, it's... I wish I could describe it clearly, verbally. I really wish I could, because I really, really wish I could harness it more clearly and be more in tune, which I'm trying to do and I have been trying to do for some time. And I wish I could teach people to somehow, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that yet. All I can do is urge people to go with their gut. You know, if you if you think this is possibly the wrong decision, it's the wrong decision. If you think this new person might be um, not so honest, they're not honest. Your initial guess, your initial reaction, your initial inner thought is always correct. Always. It's after that is when you start second guessing yourself, which I call arguing with yourself. That's when you lose. When you go against your initial. But like I said, I cannot clearly deliver it verbally, so I don't have confidence that I can teach it to people. So I guess what I'm saying is, in the end of this, what I can say with confidence is that our gut instinct, our guts, our inner voice is very, very real. It's very real. It's a real thing. It's present. I am 100% certain all of us have it in us. It just depends on how badly it's been rubbed out of you with your upbringing. I'm guessing. And I believe it is a very, very important tool in life for us and especially for society. Because if we were all absolutely in tune with it, like it was a clear voice we spoke to all the time, we would not be misled. We would not be taken advantage of. We would not be coerced. We would not be lied to because we would know and everybody in our community would know that each other already knew the truth of much if we were all absolutely in tune with our guts. So there you go. I guess that's my message. But I just wanted to share that, that I had a very uh, wild experience with my gut instincts, my inner voice screaming at me. And I listened and I followed it and it was correct. My great big old buck was there. Out of how many days and him being all over the place, he could have been absolutely anywhere and my guts were screaming at me to get up to right there. And that's where he was after all these days. Very bizarre experience to have for yourself. Probably sounds boring as shit out here, but whatever. There you go. I really need to share that. What else? For anybody else here that has my hunting apps, which I can always forget to promote. Um, 
it's very hard for me to mesh up with tech world because they need techies, total tech geeks, to manage the apps, to load new videos, to do anything, to update it. So I guess recently um, something updated for Apple and Google on their devices, which made a lot of devices not compatible with my apps. So I have to have the tech geeks update my apps. And my tech geek, who uh, went on to other things, but she still takes time when she can. She's actually in Central America right now. And I emailed her and I'm like, I'm getting hate mail. I need help. I need help. I don't know why my apps aren't working. And she's going to be on it. If she isn't on it right now, she will be very soon and she'll have the apps up and running and updated for your devices very quickly. Okay. And that's another topic. I'd like to reach out to my community somehow to find someone who knows how to do was it writing apps for both Android and Apple and uh, see if they want to jump on board with me and help manage my apps for me. All right. We'll talk about that in more detail later. But that's a big thing on my checklist and I need to get done. What else? I think that should be enough babble for right now because I really need to get a bunch of voices heard. And a lot of these emails that I have, there's so many emails. There's another thing too, just so you know, when I went full focus on this hunt, I made this all about me. What I'm passionate about. I did not check my emails. I didn't do anything. I didn't go online. I, I didn't put the video camera in my pocket. I didn't make one video. I didn't do anything. I went full tunnel vision on the hunt, my surroundings, being in nature and enjoying and connecting myself with the real world the whole time, the whole time. So I'm behind in a million emails, a lot. So I do recall that we had a lot of emails in the previous video to this share video and so and i had some emails come in here which were related to that video if that makes any sense so let's start with this one this is about man i can't even recall the last this totally ties into my last video on this channel that i posted before i went on the hunt all right it's about the hybrids. This man knows a lot about this topic, a lot. And he is absolutely accurate as far as I'm concerned. Now, why are they what they are? So tell us email. You just got a description of the baboon type of hybrid, Sabe like from the woman who sent you the pictures at the chicken pen. All right, I remember that. This observation was at a different time than the chicken event. The baboon type is bipedal, has a baboon snout, but otherwise looks like a sabe. We have the sabe with a hooded human-like nose, nostrils, and are not open outward like a gorilla, long arms, and relative to the human proportions, completely different. Legs are shorter, arms are longer, upper body is longer, and no neck above the shoulders. Where did these proportions come from? What makes the sabe look like that? The point I'm trying to make here is that that description I've seen many, many times, and people are confused as to why there could be such a different sabe. People are confused as to why they are dog-like, why there are dog-like hybrids, goat-like hybrids, ram-like hybrids. Over the years, I've seen photos of all of them and heard many encounters with these different hybrids. When I found Dogman, that thing's still working? Yeah. When I found Dogman prints, they were unmistakable. I had to pause. I don't like what the Dogman is or has been reported to be. They are on record, slaughtering people indiscriminately. The whole family was viciously slaughtered at Land Between the Lakes camping area. They are both really bad ones and ones that give you the impression that if they wanted to, they would do the same to you, but don't. And those are the good ones. I've known people who say they are not bad at all, but misunderstood. Some people nearly worship Sabe. It is critical to stay neutral. Why so many different hybrids with animal-like features? They all have height in common, so there must be some commonalities in genetics. How did the Sabe get the hooded nose? 
just getting your brain aligned here, we really are a lot smarter about how this came about than we realize. We talk about apes. I can tell you that if it has those features, there is involvement. But involvement is very limited and specific. These were engineered. They were carefully created from a central formula with add-ons in very specific locations in the genetic chain. According to the only place I can find this written, there were originally 200 different animal species used, and that's a lot. I'm guessing there are less than 20 still existing today. One version, a very early crude translation. The 200 angels, sorry, the 200 angels sized 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200 sheep and rams of the flock, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field from every animal and from every bird for experiments in inbreeding with humans and all types of miscegenation. Hope I pronounced that right. A more descriptive overview. These fallen angels knew the secrets of all things. At this time, sin was great on earth. The wicked angels killed many people and begot giants with mortal women. The wicked former angels consumed everything that the earth produced. The great fish, the birds in the sky, all the fruit of the earth, all kinds of grain, the fruit of the trees, even beasts and reptiles they committed sin against. All the creeping things of the earth, they observed slash watched all earthly things. They performed every harsh deed with harsh utterance upon male and female creation and upon slash among humanity itself. 200 angels have been persuaded to leave heaven for the earth. The 200 angels sized, seized, sorry, the 200 angels seized 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200 sheep and rams of the flock, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field from every animal and every bird for experiments in inbreeding with humans and all types of miscegenation. As a result, monsters were created among all perversion due to mingling animal seed with mortal women, similar to Egyptian gods, satires, and possibly even dinosaurs. The historian Josephus mentions that Enoch had business in Egypt, then called Syriad. The monsters sought out flesh, which could be destroyed or perverted. Could be destroyed or perverted. Monsters and giants would arise, who were lacking in true knowledge because they were abominations. Meantime, the earth grew every... Meantime, meantime the earth grew ever more corrupt and the giants more mighty. They considered trying to persuade other angels to come upon the earth Otherwise, their tyranny might ultimately perish and die. All the time, they were causing great corruption in the earth. If this aim did not suffice to perpetuate them, they would be finally destroyed, they believed. The fallen ones defiled all creation and begot giants and monster monstrous creatures and corrupted all the earth, which was defiled by blood shedding at the hands of the giants. But this did not suffice them, and they were seeking all the time to devour slash destroy many slash much more. The monsters attacked all creation. The quote, for experiments in inbreeding with humans, end quote, line was added to explain sort of what was going on. The basis was the Nephilim. These other editions of animal did not result from species in breeding, period. It was very specific genetics splicing that took place, and humans played a very, very minor role. We've already learned enough from DNA work that backs my assertion that these shared a formulaic, formulaic genetic recipe. I'm never going to say that this verifies same theory. Sorry, some theory. It doesn't. But it builds, and the probability goes up with every corroborating piece of evidence. In the field of UFO and Sasquatch, absolute verification is fleeting. But then again, it is pretty damn fleeting when it comes to academia's assertions regarding evolution of mankind. I've studied so many different kinds of historical records. 
It is a difficult matter to convey the layers of understanding that accumulate with decades of exposure. I've learned discernment pretty well, and there are so many people with way more expertise and thoroughness than me doing these same types of studies, and the conclusions are very similar. I reach out to them, and after doing this for years, I have one who is interested in assisting in giving this matter better definition and context. Context is everything. If we know why these things happen, then it begins to make sense. I fully suspect the next effort on the DNA side will definitely answer or confirm many of the assumptions we currently have. That is huge. But it has to happen before we can have certainty. There were at least 200 different animal species blended originally into a large bipedal hybrid form. Some hybrids had enough of the genes to pull those animals' natural tendencies into their behaviors. Bluff charging in all fours, escaping in all fours, sabe, sitting and watching prey from a, from a crouch on all fours, dogman. Much of what I'm telling you are my own determinations and ideas. The DNA work that I know of verifies my assessments. So it tells me my assessments are correctly based. But until I know it is okay, I won't talk about this too much. I'm looking for real answers to share, but the verification has to be in place and is just not there entirely yet. They will be shared when the time is right and the verification is in place. The reason that these cre sorry, the reason that these creatures were created should be the focus more than what they are. We already individually have our own sense of what they are. Who would recognize a dog or a baboon or a ram? The woman whose account you read hit it right the first time. Baboon. There you go. Now that comes from a man who was, who's been digging a long time. Digging a long time. And has accumulated a lot of knowledge. A lot more than me, that's for sure. Take from what you will. Or leave it but one thing for me and I'd never ever I don't need anybody to jump on my bandwagon when it comes to anything just don't what I do need is I need everybody to have fair crack at all the knowledge they can be exposed to so that their gut instincts can tell them what's legitimate or not so they can take from what they need or leave the rest that's what I need I really really need that that would make a huge difference in this world and in our societies today, right? But from what I've learned through my digging and my listening, without a doubt, these beings are hybrids. Without a doubt. They also, they also have abilities, excuse me, that the majority of us can't wrap our brains around. Maybe possibly we share those abilities and they've been intentionally rubbed out of us, which would not surprise me the slightest. But for me at this point of the game, for quite some time now, I can say with confidence that these beings that so many people have tried you, tried to keep you believing were an unrecognized monkey or gorilla, these are not. These are hybrids without a doubt, intentionally created hybrids. The proof's in. The proof exists. And there's a lot of people that came to that assumption a long time before me because they were involved with gathering the proof and dissecting it and being forced to accept it. Because they saw it. They know. Now, why the pushback? There's a question you, for all you who are following along and digging yourselves. Why the pushback? Why such fierce pushback? But we see pushback nonstop in society, especially today. Any truth, any significant truth with significant stories going on today on the, on the planet, any truth is receiving massive pushback. Right? So I'm just saying. Pushback is something to be investigated. Why the pushback? I'm starting to figure out why for myself, but I'm not ready to blurt it out publicly yet. So, there you go. For all of you who are on the same page, there you go. For all of you that are on the first step, 
trying to catch up to us, which we're probably about on the 500th flight of stairs now. Keep listening. Keep listening. Now, who else? Um, okay, hold on a second. Okay, now here's another one. And this was, remember we had a 12 year old boy email us on my last email, on my last video share of emails, okay? Remember that? This is titled Grandfather of 12 year old, 12 year old Caden. All right, because I urged him to get his grandfather to email us and his experiences too, and he emailed us. Hello, Steve, and everyone in the club in no return. My name is Ken, and I am the grandfather of my now 14-year-old grandson, Caden. And yes, we were up on the mountain by Brian Head, Utah, when, this, when his encounter happened. I'll go ahead and share my story with you and all the people. So back in 78, when I was 13 years old, living in Anchorage, Alaska, I was in the Boy Scouts, and we were on a 50-mile hike across Resurrection Pass. We started on a Monday morning, Little did we know, a group of Civil Air Patrol kids were on that hike as well. We'd stop for a break, and the Civil Air Patrol kids would walk by us and heckle us and say, What's the matter? Are you tired? Can't walk anymore? And we just heckled back at them. Then a little while up the trail, they would be taking a break, and we'd give them shit as we walked by, giving them the same shit as they gave us. You know, just a little fun. Well, it ended up being that, they, that we did this for a couple of days. We ended up about Thursday, camping at the same camping area along a lake. I can't remember what lake it was, but I knew it was about 30 miles or so in the backcountry. Well, on their side of the campground, they were having a bonfire. And so, being boys like us, we snuck up in the dark to the campfire and threw firecrackers in their fire. And their leaders and all of the kids jumped up and ran away from the fire. And then later on, we were sitting around our fire, and they came over to our fire with buckets of water in the dark and threw water on our fire and put it out. We were just giving each other shit the whole week. Well, the next morning when I woke up, our leaders and their leaders were standing there talking. My scout leader told me to come over, so I went over to him. And the other men and my scout leaders asked me, so where's the fake Bigfoot tracks? Who's got them? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, look at all the tracks around here. Somebody's got to have some fake Bigfoot tracks to make these. And I looked at him kind of weird and said, I don't have any, and I don't know who does. Maybe they do, pointing over to the other camp. And the adults are like looking at each other with worried looks. So they gathered all of us boys around them. They asked us all who had the fake tracks. We all looked at each other like, are you crazy or something? At the time, we all knew about some stupid show on TV called Bigfoot and Little Boy. We all knew about that show, but we knew it was kind of stupid. But we all watched it anyways, lol. But a couple hours later, one of the boys from the Civil Air Patrol camp said that his hand hurt, and that something stepped on his hand in the middle of the night. And he ended up having a couple broken fingers. And where his tent was at, there was a footprint where his hand was outside of his tent during the night. So, needless to say, we had one more a day on the trail, and we got the hell out of there. And from that time on, I've always been aware of the Sabe people. I've never seen one in person. But waking up to those tracks and knowing it wasn't us that made those tracks gave me a whole new perspective on what is out there in the wilderness. I think, I thank God none of us boys were hurt or abducted by one of those big bastards. That's why I told my grandson, you're staying in the damn camper tonight. You're not staying in that damn tent. Ken Brinkerhoff. Ken, I absolutely appreciate you. Not only for doing this, but for uh, making sure your grandson gets taken out into the real world and spending time with him out there. That's huge. Appreciate your time, sir. Appreciate your time. We all do. For that share. And there you go. More people who accept 
the truth. Now, who's next? This is titled, My Northern BC Experiences. Hi Steve, my name is Amanda. I'm new to your channel, but really enjoying it so far. Thank you for all you do. I've been travel nursing in remote northern communities in BC since 2020. In the summer of 2021, I took an assignment in Fort Nelson, British Columbia, my old home away from home. August 7th, 2021, I decided to borrow the staff vehicle from the hospital I was working at and use my one day off to travel up to the Liard River. It takes about five hours to get there for Fort Nelson. As I took in the scenery on the drive up, the sheer remote and rugged nature of the land was palpable. I was on the way back home and close to the 529 kilometer mark of the Alaska Highway when all of a sudden a feeling came over me. For reasons unknown, I began to slow the car down. I was going quite slow when I saw it on all fours on the right hand side of the road. It was about 100 feet away at this point. It was moving towards the road coming out of the bush very quickly on the tips of its fingers and toes. Then it stopped at the edge of the highway. At this time, I had come to a full diagonal stop in the oncoming lane. This creature was now about 20 feet away. It got up on two legs and appeared to be somewhere around 9, maybe 10 feet tall. It was covered in matted gray slash brown hair that looked like dreadlocks. It had a solid muscular build. It walked in a very strange manner that is hard to describe if you haven't seen it and crossed the paved part of the highway in four strides. It did not look directly at me, but was very aware of my presence. And I felt it inside my mind when it walked in front of the car. I was completely frozen. I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. Here's the wildest part of all. Parts of this creature were partially transparent. These parts would fade from visible to transparent over its entire body as it crossed the road. The transparent parts of the creature appeared blurry, or almost made of water, if that makes sense. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. I watched it disappear into the trees on the other side of the road. After a while, I collected myself and drove the remaining 75 kilometers back to Fort Nelson. Fast forward three weeks later. Picked up a friend and took him up the Alaska Highway. We made it to Muncho Lake before returning around to head back as we both worked in the morning. We were within five kilometers of the spot I had seen this creature a few weeks back. It was 2 a.m. And we see this big buck going crazy in the middle of the road. It kept running in and out of the bush and onto the highway. We pulled over and stopped in the hopes the deer would leave the road so we could pass without hitting him. Our friend got out to take a peep. I got up to stretch my legs, and suddenly the buck ran up the steep hill on the other side of the road. It never made it to the top. It disappeared into a patch of small trees, and what followed were some of the sickest sounds I've ever heard. Bones snapping, one after the other. Then complete silence. Eerie silence. All of a sudden, two bright blue eyes that looked like blue LED lights the size of tennis balls lit up in the dark just above the spot where the buck charged in. The eyes seemed to create their own light and were so bright. I could see a wide nose along with the eyes staring down at me from the hill. It never blinked. It just stared as if to say, get out or you're next. My friend finished his bathroom break and I pointed to the creature staring down at us and said what I had seen. He just said we should get out of there. I've had some other strange experiences out there as well as other places. Looking forward to traveling Alaska Highway again someday. I know you mentioned that you've never seen anything goofy along that stretch, so I hope this inspires you to keep trying in that area. They're definitely there. Thanks again, Steve Amanda. Well, there you go. Now, this is what I can add to that from my personal first-hand experiences. God, I'm so freaking tired still. I feel like I can sleep a week. 75K, so I'm guessing that was a round uh, steamboat 
for sure. I already know it is around Steamboat. Just so all of you know, and you, Amanda, I guided in that area starting over 20 years ago. And I used to spend um, July, August, September, October up there. Uh, mainly at Toe River, which is between Fort Nelson and Macho Lake, as you know, Amanda. Now, uh, years ago, and I believe I shared the story and the photos in the past, I was with a couple of characters in this other outfit who I got it for, whose camp was just past Tetsa River. Now, Tetsa River is the first gas stop on the left when you leave Fort Nelson. And that is as well, just beyond the area that Amanda just, Amanda just mentioned. And uh, we were dropped off there, right around where Amanda mentioned her experience. And we were dropped off and we were to ride to the north side of Alaska Highway, way the hell back, I believe we're at the head of Cledo Creek, K-L-E-D-O. You can Google that up on the maps, Cledo Creek. And there was no roads back there. I believe there's roads now. But there wasn't, there was nothing. We're talking nothing. But miles of spruce, miles of swamp, birch, poplar, whatever you want to call them. Tons of moose, grizzly bears, everything, right? But we're more down in the flats on the east slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And we're breaking open, we're to ride back there and break open the old camps that the outfitter had. And these were made by the other previous outfitter. Cliff Andrews, who passed away, and he, he was noted as making the most horrendous horse trails, which he did, I'll tell you what, it was nasty. What an adventure. Anyway, one of the camps we got to was the head of Cleto Creek, I believe, and um, there was a cache there. And a cache is a, is a platform built on top of tree trunks with about a four foot overhang all the way around, four to five foot overhang, so that nothing can climb up there. And I believe that one has sheet metal wrapped around the base of the four poles too, so that really nothing can get up there. The claws even try to. And I took photos of this and I might have shared them here and if I didn't I'll dig them up and I'll share them later on. But there was scratch marks all over those poles, grizzly bears trying to climb up there. Now on top of that platform was, you know, the rubber made bins with a bunch of those all packed in but on horseback. A full camp was there, rubber made bins and had you know, cutlery and stoves and stove fuel and maybe spices and flippers and all sorts of shit in there. Matches, stuff you need to survive. And as well, about a 150 pound wall tent, canvas wall tent, wrapped up and tied up. And that was all on there and it was all tarped up. Previous. So as we are riding along the river and getting near to this camp, we started seeing debris all over the place, including the 150 pound wall tent, which was alongside the river not a tooth mark in it. Excuse me. When we got to where the cache was, the whole thing was completely cleared off. And it was strewn about, freaking everywhere. And I'll never forget looking around thinking. So, uh, what did this? Right? And these two rednecks I was with, they didn't, they didn't want to talk about or acknowledge that it was odd. They just started, you know, cleaning stuff up. And I go, come on, you guys, we only did this. Or I was probably Wolverine. I'm like, a Wolverine? <laughs> really? So Wolverine uh, shinied up the pole, passed the sheet metal, and he used his claws to get out to the underside of the hung from his claws and went like this, the outside edge, climbed over the top, and threw the 150 pound canvas wall tent 100 yards over the to the side of the river and went to clearing everything off. So, so are we telling me, you know? And they were annoyed and didn't want to talk about it. I got no problem not talking about it them about anything really but anyway there you go amanda and that was definitely 100 percent in line with where you had your experience now moving along up to Muncho lake Muncho lake is like my backyard i know much of the yard the whole stretch of that highway intimately every game trail almost um there have been some sightings at Muncho lake as well as an old guy partner friend of mine from toad river he recalls they were driving up to the hot springs that we are, I think, from Toad River, or coming back, it was in the dark and the headlights, and he took note that something ran across in front of him in the headlights, and he thought it was a moose, thought it was the hind end and the back legs of the moose, but he said that, I'll never forget he mentioned this, but the knees were bending the wrong way. So, for all you know, the, the moose 
will bend backwards. The kneecap goes to the back on a moose. Whereas us humans are a bipedal upright person, your knees bend forward. And I'll never forget he said that. But the knees were bent the wrong way to be a moose in the headlights. There you go, that's that much a leg. I have friends in Fort Nelson. There's been a lot of sightings around Fort Nelson. Tracks in the river below the highway bridge. Um, I have friends from Fort Nelson who took the horses in going towards Toshody Lakes. They started riding at Tetsa, I believe, and they woke up two trees being beat, beaten, beaten on on the same slope of the mountain they were on. They heard it in the early morning hours. Very loud. That's about it, but I never had any first-hand experiences of any kind of weirdness at all, and I was predominantly in a camp on the north side of the highway, north of Summit. You know, you have Summit and that lake's on the left. Well, we were north, over top of those mountains, and then some on the east slopes of the Rocky Mountains. We're talking middle of freaking nowhere, man. We'd be the only ones out there, ever. But there you go. I'm sure there's a lot more people here that have more experiences to share along that specific area. Uh, Pink Mountain, a little further south. Pink Mountain is on fire with, with sightings activity. And then just a little more south of that is where I've been having my current experiences with the noise in the night. The knife showing up in my backpack, which I cannot say Sabe related myself. But it was a very, very, very odd experience. Very odd experience. But anyway. Um, all right, I've got a few things i got to unpack my vehicle. I haven't done that yet. i got a bunch of stuff to deal with, including this big buck I got in the truck. i got to get the meat to the butcher to make it. We're going to get a bunch of yummy stuff made out of it and uh, get caught up and get back to being normal again. <laughs> I've been a feral human being for a handful of days now, out of touch with everybody and everything, and I gotta get my shit back together and then get back to regular sharing of every voice I can. Every voice I can. So anyway, the summary of this video share today is the truth is going to be and is absolutely difficult for your average human mind to wrap around. That is something we can say and speak of with absolute confidence. There are a lot of human beings out there who do not want us to understand or know the truth when it comes to this topic and more. That's a fact. But just so you know, no matter how bizarre some of these, some of these email shares are, or some of the things that I agree with may sound to you, it's gonna to be tough, man. The truth that you seek coming here to this channel is not going to be an easy thing for you to wrap your mind around and accept. I wish I could pass that on to everybody in the world so that they already pre had the heads up warning that it's going to be difficult for everyone to wrap your brain around the truth. There is some kind of a force out there, a group, an individual, whatever you want to call it, who does not want us to know our true history, the truth. They just don't. And so far they've been pretty damn successful at keeping us in the dark, right? Anyway, we're gonna keep pushing on. We're gonna listen to everyone, no matter what. And every single human being that comes here is here, the door, the door is wide open. You're free to come and go, as long as you stay respectful and just take what you need for your own puzzle and leave the rest and don't blow a three-year-old gasket because somebody might have shared something that you just can't wrap your brain around all right go with your gut instincts you'll know the truth when you hear it it doesn't matter the topic unless you're completely washed and have been suppressed so fiercely that you're so out of tune, it's impossible for you to even, even entertain some of these truths in life. But the sooner you get in tune with your guts, the sooner you realize that you will know the truth when you hear it. Because you're in tune with your, with your guts, your sixth sense, your instincts. The truth that we are trying to provide here is going to be very difficult to accept for the majority of the people listening. 
there you go. But we will never, ever change the truth, the truths that we know, that we're discovering, that, we're, that are being shared. No matter how crazy it starts to seem, we're not going to change just to keep people comfortable. Right? Just because you can't handle the truth doesn't mean it's true. You know what I mean? I can't babble a little bit. Get a little fired up. So there you go. What else? I got a bunch of hunting stories. People send me in a lot of photos and their hunt success stories. And I'm going to share those stories and the photos on the How to Hunt YouTube channel as well. And I'm going to encourage people too. If you got if you got a real exciting or fun or proud moment hunting story you want to share with me, I'll share it. I'll share it with the world on that channel as well. Just same as I'm doing here with these emails of truth from people, all right? So I'll be doing that fairly soon, as well as sharing my own hunt hunt uh, summary from this past couple of weeks. I'm going to share what I can. I've got a video, and I'll share my whole story on there when it comes to what I just pulled off of this big, huge buck. And uh, for anybody out there who is curious and knows hunting and mule deer and antlers and everything, just so you know, it was a 196-inch mule deer. So there you go. I'll be back tomorrow. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you're going to get your truth shared word for word. I'll be back. Thank you.